I'm Lee Haber. You know Kelly. Yeah. Um, I'm the books editor for Oh, the Oprah Magazine. And Kelly and I have become almost colleagues over the past year yeah. because we're doing so much work with her. We love her so much for obvious reasons. Um, so Kelly, let's just like dip right in. Okay. All right, so what is the hardest part for you? One of the things I love about this book, for those of you who haven't read it yet, you've just got so much delight ahead of you. But I mean, it's so real. You know, you don't pretend to be a person who is flawless, right? <laughs> Maybe appearance-wise, yes, but, but you know, you, um, you talk to, you communicate on the page as, um, you know, you communicate all of your m misgivings, some pettiness every now and then, um, and you're always searching, but it's not, you know, in a kind of uh, looking down sort of way. So I was just, I'm, I'm curious about how you are so real on the page. I mean, do you ever like filter in a way, I don't want the reader to think this about me. You know, I, I'd rather put myself forward as being like really heroic all the time. I, I feel anxious about that. I, I mean, I feel anxious about all parts of self-representation, as one should, I think. I think it would be really dangerous if you didn't consider how honest you are able to be about yourself while also protecting the people around you. So like, I'm not gonna talk about my sex life because I have a real husband who has a real job with real people who would give him so much shit on the side <laughs> if, if his wife was talking about how frequently or infrequently, uh, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so, oh, I just remembered we're on Facebook Live. Hi! <laughs> uh, so let me roll that back. I also have two daughters and they're teenagers and so they've completely lost their sense of humor and so they don't really want to be on the page that much. But then I have this great need to represent myself as is, warts and all, for two reasons. One is because um, I, I am a very emotional person, so I feel things strongly. I feel very, very happy sometimes, and I feel very sad, and I feel furious, um, and I, have, I get anxious sometimes. And um, so I want to represent all I that. relate to what you're talking about at all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to represent all that on the page while also somehow acknowledging that, like, you know, as things go, I have a pretty charmed life. Like, I like my husband. He likes me. I think that's, like, a pretty nice fundamental thing to have in place. I'm healthy. My family is healthy. Um, so there's a lot of big, huge basics are in place. I, I own a house. I have heat. I can take a shower every day if I choose to, but I don't. Um, <laughs> And so it's, I, that's the balance. What about today? I did take, I took a bath today because I don't have a bathtub, but in this hotel that I'm in, there was a bathtub. So I took a bath and drank my coffee in the bathtub. And I felt like the Queen of Sheba, let me tell you. Um, so that, that's the thing that scares me, the, that I feel the most anxious about, is that someone might read it and think, oh my God, she thinks this is a problem? And I don't really, except when I'm in it. And I think that's true for everyone. And I think that we're not so different than our teenage selves who are getting whipped up about something that we will later, later look back on and think, I can't believe I worried about like my junior year term paper. You know, but I, of course I'm gonna look back and say, I can't believe I worried about my junior daughter's term paper. You know, like we're always fools for ourselves. And that's really the heart of the book for me, which is I would like to get some maxims together in one place that I can return to so that, that like my better self can meet my worst self, can beat my worst self more often than not. Your highest, bravest self, as you say. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Well, the self that honors the fact that I'm just so lucky. Well, so we're kind of along in this book, we're kind of along as readers, along for the ride, watching you try to be on that journey yeah. and using different ways you know, approaches um, in various situations to sometimes to pull back, yes. you know, sometimes to um, go for, you know, connect more. But tell us about that impulse, I think especially in um, some of the chapters that have to do with being a parent, yeah. where you're just learning to hold back a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure. So the book is named after the chapter that's called Tell Me More. It used to be called Big Words, and then it was Magic Words, and it all kind of spun out of this dinner table conversation that we were having about 
what are like the most important words in the English language? Like what words do we say to one another that actually allow us to be in these long, complex, deep relationships? So I was wrong is one of them. No is for sure one of them. I don't know is it for sure one of them. But tell me more is new to me because I, my love is very proactive and, and I'm an extrovert and I'm a problem solver. And I like roll up those sleeves like pretty fast. But when you're parenting, the job, I believe, shifts on this continuum from being incredibly hands-on, where you are carrying your child through the world and doing absolutely everything for them, to letting them go. And so you're very leaned forward. And then you just slowly, over 13, 15, 18, 20 years, you just slowly lean back. And there's reasons why that's so hard. It, it is like this, this the, the loss of your lives. It is also the achievement of your lives and a lot of positive things. But it is like the, the biggest heartbreak of your life is that, they, that you have raised them to leave, which is so beautiful and impressive and amazing. And that's, why, that's, that's what we did. But it is also like, oh my God, what kind of setup is this? That I am going to love this person in a way that I, it is not conceivable for me to feel about another human being and that by definition they are going to leave me. And that is actually my highest hope is that they become independent of me. And so in the process, I have two teenage girls. I have a 14 year old and a 16 year old. And in the process what I'm learning is to say tell me more. Not just to get out of their hair but also because it, there's something deeply humble about saying that. It, because when you say, tell me more, you're saying, I don't know the answer. And I'm not going to jump in after you've told me like two things and tell you how to solve it. Because really, most of the time, the headline event that starts a conflict or a problem has very little to do with the actual problem. Like you know this from marriage, right? That whatever you're fighting about, it's not the dishes. And there's the thing behind the thing behind the thing. But if you really want to get to the thing behind the thing behind the thing, the only way is tell me more. Tell me more. Is there more? Say more. Well, you know what? So it's beautifully illuminated in the book. In your, I think you're in the car with your friend, yeah. your old, old friend. And um, you were joking backstage stage about taking criticism and so on. But I was thinking, so they're in this car, and you take a call from your daughter yeah. who's upset about something. And you're starting to like jump in, jump in, jump in. And your friend basically says, hold back. Yes. And um, you didn't get defensive at all. I mean, that would have been a time also to feel like, well, you know, who are you to tell me how to feel? Oh, yes. But she's so much better than I am. She's talking about <laughs> Tracy Tuttle, is, or Tracy McGowan now is my college roommate. And she is just such a kind, thoughtful person and, and really diligent about parenting. And so I, I, I felt so lucky that this call came in while I had this like Cyrano de Bergerac next to me <laughs> saying what to say and not say. And it, it like she, Georgia, my daughter who was crying on the phone, just like unraveled herself right in front of my ears, if you will. Oh, it's so beautifully written. And it, it was just like, oh my God, I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see it with my, if I didn't hear it with my own ears. Uh, like she just worked it, her, she just worked it out for herself because I really, really, really believe this. I'm 50, and this is like one of the three things I believe the most is the number one thing that people want in those circumstances is to feel they have been felt. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that, then that leads you leaves you only one option, which is to feel them. But it it the it's two parts. You have to feel them, and then you have to make sure they know you felt them. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes there's um, people in your life who say, oh, I love you so much, and it's like, right, but I can't really feel it. So I think there's a little work left to be done. And same for me. If you can't feel that I love you, then I have a little bit left, a little bit more ground to cover. And it's the same with this, which is I'm going to feel you, and you're going to know it. You're going to feel that I have felt you. And the way you're going to do that is I'm going to keep taking it in. I'm going to, it's like emotional spring cleaning. I'm just going to keep absorbing like the thing behind the thing behind the thing behind the thing. And like how great is it to feel like you finally got to the nut of your pain and that someone else heard it. Like to be witnessed, to be observed, to be received, that is like yeah, sacred. It's everything. 
It yeah. really is. Um, really getting worked up up here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really feeling this. Well, you know, another, um, I love the book so much. I really, really do. And um, so does everyone at the you magazine. You You guys editor. will too. Yeah. yeah. Good idea. <laughs> um, but there's, a se there's also a section where, I think it's called I'm Wrong. Yeah, I was that, wrong. I was wrong. And there's a line there, and you can describe what happened um, <laughs> in, in, the, in that chapter. But there's a line about how just because you do a bad thing doesn't make you bad. Yeah. And, yeah. And that really struck me because I think so often, you know, we do something or we, we feel like we've misspoken or, you know, we haven't been thoughtful enough and it just kind of pervades everything. Yeah. And when you just step back and say, you know, I screwed up, but that doesn't right. mean I'm a screw up. Right. But why don't right. you tell us about the... I well, you know, I was... I, it, the, each chapter has about, like, three, let's say, three or four different little stories. Some are mine, some are about other people's, that sort of illustrate the words. So in I Was Wrong, one of the story, one of the things that I carried with me was that I did not... I lived in Baltimore as a 24-year-old. I worked for United Way during the day and wrote books that will never be published at night. <laughs> And um, my grandmother, my dad's, who I love so dearly, uh, my dad's mother uh, lived nearby. Her name is Kalita, and she was 80 years old, let's say, and she lived in a little place. It was really only about 12 or 15 minutes from my office. And I went to visit her once in a whole year. And then she died. And I felt so ashamed of myself. And I had this story in my head that my cousin Lisa I'm one of 29 cousins on the Corrigan side. So there's a lot of people, and I think maybe in my little way, you know how you like tell a little lie to yourself so that you don't have to feel bad? The little lie I told myself was, there are a lot of Corrigan cousins. There's, she probably has people visiting all the time. And, but cousin Lisa would go see her like once a week, and she'd just pop in. Once you, if you see somebody once a week, then the whole nature of the visit is different. It's not such a drama. You just pop in for 15 minutes. You play a game of like Rummy 500 with her eat some burger cookies, you're out of there. But for me, I had built it up as this thing. And then she died, and I thought, oh, well, I'm just not a person like Cousin Lisa. Like, Cousin Lisa's like a good person, and I'm a bad person. And worse was that my, my dad noticed. Yeah, and he didn't let you off the hook. He didn't. He didn't. And he, and, you know, he, he was so, like, such a phenomenal, supportive human being to me and most others. And the fact that he didn't let me off the hook, of course, carried this like incredible weight in my heart. And I, I had to wait all weekend. You know, he's, grief is a very busy activity in the beginning, and there's a lot to do planning a funeral and giving a eulogy and getting people to the um, graveyard and, you know, just a thousand little things to do. And I just was hovering around and waiting for like the moment to say my piece. And that was something I really learned, too, is that your need to be forgiven does not trump their need to feel their feelings. So he's, he's busy. So you're just going to have to, like, sit in your regret like cold bathwater until he turns around and has a minute to deal with you and your, you know, and your apology. And then that got me to, like, the difference between saying I'm sorry and saying I was wrong. And I really came out. I really thought about this. I talked to a lot of people about it. And I came out on the side of I was wrong as the stronger, more humble statement, and therefore the statement that would probably have more power in most situations. There's also a chapter where you talk about, um, well, it, this is kind of throughout, but your mom being um, a no pro. She is, the, she is the Rosa Parks of no. <laughs> like, she just gets it done. So what have you learned from your mom about saying no? Well, and, saying and you no, say you're, you're not. You're not always. Sometimes you give in, also. Oh, I've I give in so much more than I ever dreamed I would. I can't believe it. Um, I mean, I, I one thing is I can't believe how much I need slash want my kids to like me, which is different than love me. Um, and and my mom really wasn't operating on that plane. Mm -hmm. She gave up that box. She was like, Yeah, you're gonna. If I do this right, you're not going to like me very much for a long time. And then you're going to love me. And I just, I can't hold the line. Also, my kids, and I was too, are like formidable opponents. So when I go to war with Georgia over something, like 
she's got really good moves. I mean, she, <laughs> and it's like going yeah, to war true. with my younger self, and it's just like spattle of the wills, and I don't know, I peed her out before she does. Like, she wins, like, way more than she should. And if you're watching this, Georgia, those days are over. <laughs> um, so but you did the, give in on the third season of The Bachelorette, I read. I did give in on The Bachelorette. She watches The Bachelorette. So I was bemoaning that to my mother, and she's like, oh, for God's sake, Kelly, you watch General Hospital. What's the difference? <laughs> and I was like, blah, 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 blah. Um, But so the, the willingness to be unpopular, both like within your family structure, but also like within your town, and most of us here, I think, are women, and there is this like tremendous sense that like, this desire to say yes, like people love you when you say yes. You know, the, one of my <laughs> one of my favorite moments in Piedmont, California, was uh, at back to school night. There was kind of a veteran mom who was on her fourth kid, and then there were all these like first kid moms in the same classroom, right? And so the veteran mom stands up, and she's this nurse from Ireland who's been living in Piedmont for a while, and she says, "Right, and on the last thing, that's a terrible accent, but." Uh, the last thing is we need someone to do the scarecrow for, you know, Halloween week. And then one of the newbie moms is like, you know, do, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing it, but I mean, do people like help out? And she's like, not usually, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I love that woman so much for being honest, because really that is part of the calculus in terms of making that decision is we should not be misleading each other all the time and saying yes when the answer is no. Um, and you shouldn't but, sign. Do you think that's a temperamental thing, or do you think that's kind of generational, like in terms of parenting? I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you th did your mom say no a lot? Yeah. Did you say yes more? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Oh well, I feel a lot less guilty then. Yeah. See. <laughs> like you're all caving. Is that what you're saying? Another chapter. We're all caving together. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 What'd you say? Not the photo no. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, then, maybe it is generational. And then um, one of the chapters we adapted in O Magazine, um, which just like kills me every time I read it, um, is um, you lost your friend Liz and, uh, to ovarian cancer. And you just write so movingly, um, in particular, about when there's nothing left to say or do, basically, mm -hmm. right? You know, so... Can you talk a little bit about those moments with her when yeah. you realized? You know, th so there's a chapter that's, that's called No Words at All. Um, and I had, this, th there were so many occasions where I felt like words were inappropriate or insufficient or um, almost trivializing. But in particular, one was like during those first, she died on December 12th, and during those first couple weeks, like leading into Christmas, of course, like all my friends wanted to reach out and see how I was doing and that sort of thing. And people who didn't know Liz, you know, people who knew that my friend had died. And, uh, and I really had a hard time returning those calls because I had this strong sense that as soon as we got on the phone, we were going to start saying thing, words that just made it so small and ordinary. And I know people die. And I know probably everybody in here has lost a friend by this point. But I didn't care in that moment. I didn't want it to be something that had ever happened in the history of the world before. I didn't want to compare notes. It was so big, and I didn't want it to be smaller. And so I was afraid that people were going to say things like, you know, oh, she suffered so much, or she she worked so hard or she fought so hard and you know um you know there's there's blessings and the silver linings that we can't anticipate and all that kind of stuff and i just thought not one word i don't want to hear one word about this i don't want to and andy interestingly her husband who's our great friend he she died on a saturday and he didn't call us until sunday and um and I really understood that. I re it really made sense to me that he didn't want it to begin to change and begin to become something that people could even stand to say out loud. And it's funny because sitting here right now and thinking about this book tour, I realized that because I've written a lot about her in this book, 
that I'm gonna have to say words a lot. And sometimes when you say them a lot, there's like kind of that exposure therapy thing that happens where you don't feel what you're saying anymore. And I really dread that. Like now, I know my first book, The Middle Place, uh, had to do with this year that both my father and I had cancer. And there used to be a time, I mean, of course there was a time. The very first time you say to somebody, I have cancer, is a lot different than the 500th. I mean, it almost has no meaning to me now. It almost, I almost can't even remember it. And I was in treatment for two years, and it, it still it feels like, a, like I'm lying, like I'm making up a story to hold your attention. And I don't want that to happen with Liz. I want her to stay like a, my Liz, my, my person, my friend. And you said Andy's going to do some, some of the events with you. He is. He's, he's such a remarkable human being. And I knew he was remarkable in certain ways. He's a very successful businessman. He started, he and my husband went to business school together at Stanford. And then he went on and started this watch company called Nixon. Has anyone ever heard of yeah, Nixon yeah, watches? Yeah. You have? Right on. Uh, so anyway, he started Nixon. And uh, it was a great ride. And it was really consuming for him. And Liz often was afraid that what he was good at wasn't going to get him very far once she died and he was going to have to become a mother and a father. But the, we were looking at like the wrong side of it. We were looking at an application of what he's good at. What he's good at is being good at things. He's like a good student. He's a hardworking, ambitious person who seeks to understand. He's good at asking for advice. He's good at collating advice and sifting through it. And all those skills that he applied to the Nixon story are now being redirected toward learning how to be a mom and a dad and learning how to be Liz in her absence. And he has the exact same kind of A student attitude, like this is a thing to be figured out, this is gonna take work, I'm gonna have to stay up late, I'm gonna have to read, I'm gonna have to ask opinions, I'm gonna have to work it through, make mistakes, reapproach, and everything that made him, you know, the guy he is, is making him the father he is and really the mother that he is. Kelly, um, we're gonna, in a few minutes, we're gonna have to take, we're gonna go to questions, but I have one more question, and um, I think it was Huffington Post I, who called you the poet laureate of the ordinary. Yeah, and I really liked that, I gotta say. I, Whoever wrote that, thank you, I liked that. I love that, and even the thing you were saying about regret being like in a, you know, in a tub of cool water, whatever. Yeah. You know, you just do that conversationally, and you write conversationally, and that's such a gift. What is your process? I mean, do you like tape record yourself? I, I'm in conversation. I, I, oh, that was a really smart thing I said. <laughs> because when you read your book, and it's very much like talking to you. You know, I definitely, uh, as I write, I read it out loud to myself. And if it sounds natural coming out of my mouth, then it, then it feels like something I want to put on paper. I, I sometimes feel like I'm writing for an audience of one who is Edward, like I, my husband. husband. Because I, I think, it, I, don't, I want him, I don't want to like be trying so hard that Edward's like, oh, yeah, you're like kind of pushing it a little here, like trying to sound too flowery or like wise, mountaintop wise. And, you know, whatever, and I, so I, I am always picturing like what, what, would, what would Edward's facial expression be if I were talking like this at a cocktail party and he was watching me do this? Would he be like, that's my wife, man, I love that woman? <laughs> or would he be like, whoa, like let's just cool it with the pontificating? Um, so that, that's like what's in my head, you know? So but even though I read, like the stuff I love is like Marilyn Robinson and it's stuff that's... Um, oh, she has a great new essay collection coming out, by the way. Oh. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it's interesting for me because what I like reading and what I like and the way I want to write, the way I want to stay contained, especially in memoir. Like I do have someday I want to write a novel and I have a story that I like. And I think that la the language I'll be able to use there and the tone... I'll be a little freer. But this is me, and I don't want it to, you know how, like when you, sometimes when I meet people at a reading, they say, oh my God, you look just like your picture. And I think, that's right. <laughs> and I'm just like my writing. Like I didn't, I don't become somebody else on the page, and I don't Photoshop my wrinkles, and you know, what, what she is, wrinkles? what you get. God 
damn it. Right here, baby. <laughs> Eight lane highway. That's what bangs are for. Yep, that's what bangs are for, as you know from the book. So tell me more. Here's the last story before we have questions. Tell me more. Um, the, the first person who said it to me was this woman. So she was giving me a facial. I never do facials, but somebody had given me a gift because I had done them a favor. So I went into San Francisco and I go in and this like android beautiful millennial type, like, is like, hello, welcome. And I was like, hi, hi, you know, I'm here for a facial. And she's like, great, you are with Tish today. And I was like, okay, great, I'm with Tish. And, get, you know, I'm in the chair and whatever. And she's doing her thing and like extracting things and metal tools are coming out. And the thing is like an inch from my nose. And I'm thinking about like mites. Did you know that there are like mites on our faces? Anyway, that occurred to me. Um, and then, Toward the end, she's about to like lay out all the products that she would recommend for a face such as mine. And I said, before you go too deep on this thing, I want to tell you a few things. I'm super cheap, and I'm super lazy, uh, and I have generally like bad habits. And she's like, tell me more. And I said, you know, I just like I want to spend money on these things, but like in the end, like I buy Maybelline from Target. And I don't wash my face at night. I don't put lotion on at night. Like, you know, I don't have like those habits. I don't even shower. Like I shower like twice a week because I don't really exercise. So I don't really sweat. So like you can see how this all gets. And I'm just doing all this. And she's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, really taking me in. And I said, so like now that you've got a sense of what's like realistic for me, if you could, I do really am starting to hate my forehead. Like I can see it. Uh, when I like, I can see it sometimes in my computer screen. I can see the wrinkles reflected back at me. And so if you did have one thing to recommend, what would it be? And she said, bangs. <laughs> Love it. And I was like, you really listened to me. <laughs> and on that note, I guess we'll, we'll take questions. <laughs> Just raise your hand, we'll bring you a mic. Say it again. Just raise your hand, we'll bring you a mic. Oh. Oh, I'm coming. Look at her go. She's young. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Kelly, first of all, I think you'd be happy to know that Radnor High School won the 120th meeting of Radnor LM for the, uh, the longest high school rivalry. My kids go to Radnor High School. And Isn't it great? I love Radnor. Um, I'm wondering about your relationship with your parents. Um, and I'm so sorry for the loss of your dad. It's obvious how close you were to him and um, your writing. And um, you have um, an interesting relationship with your mother. And I'm wondering what she thinks of her portrayal in your books. I mean, it's it's not as you know warm as it was with your dad. She's a wonderful person, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the people that you write about that are real life in your um, in, in your life, how do they perceive themselves or how do yeah. they appreciate being written about, I guess? So my mom is such an interesting person because on the one hand, she's super private, so it's just most unfortunate that her child has chosen this as a vocation. <laughs> but she's also like level 10 maternal because at the end of the day, she wants for us whatever we want for ourselves, whether she thinks we should want it or not and whether it inconveniences her or puts her in the spotlight or not. So when The Middle Place came out, there was still a thing called Borders Books. And between her, she sold real estate. Between her real estate office and our house was a Borders Books, and it was two stories. And she would, I'd call her and say, hey, how are you? And she'd say, oh, I'm good. I'm working on that closing. And then I had to stop by Borders and move the books. <laughs> Three times a week. She would stop by Borders and go to the second floor to the shelf where the middle place was, my first book, which was near the bathroom in like medical narrative, which she thought was like not appropriate. Take the six copies down the stairs and then right near the cash register, she'd like, she said, I did my rainbow display. And like right by the magazines, I made it go up, 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 across, down, down, down. And I thought two things, like I would do that. I would for sure do that for my kid, whether I wanted that book to be out in the world or not. And two, like you are, you're, the thing that trumps everything with you is your maternal love. Way down the list is her desire for privacy. 
The other thing I'll say about her is that she's very comfortable with the way she's chosen to live her life and the way she parented. So like in Glitter and Glue, I tell this story about I um, accidentally went shoplifting one day at Sears. Um, and I took like $52 worth of like weird jewelry, um, pant control top pantyhose with reinforced toe. I know, it's not funny. We shouldn't be laughing. And, um, and but the pantyhose... <laughs> <laughs> the pantyhose were... Did the publisher know this before yeah, they my, acquired your... My my, the pantyhose were for my mother for her birthday <laughs> because all right. she's such a practical woman that that's what she would want. You know, it was like something she was going to get already that now she doesn't have to get. And so anyway, I, I, she picks me up. I got caught. I go to the office, security office or whatever, and she has to come. She picks me up. We come out. And I'm sitting in the car, and we're sitting in this freezing parking lot. It's super dark. And she, I say, start to say, the pantyhose were for you. <laughs> and she just whoosh, slaps me across the face. And I don't know, it was winter, my nose was dry. Who knows? Or maybe it was just a really good whack. But whoosh, uh, blood went on the window. <laughs> so I tell this story in Glitter and Glue. And when I, the day I was writing this story, I was, as I was typing away, like my fingers were doing all the work for me. This story is vivid in my mind. Uh, I'm thinking she's never going to let me publish this. I don't even know why I'm bothering, like, squandering a writing session on this story, but I just can't stop myself, so I'm going to write it out. So then I give her the book to read at, before it's due, and she comes back and she said, well, I think it's your best one, Kelly. <laughs> and, and I said, um, well, I would hope so. Like, it's kind of all about you and, and how much I came to love you. And she's like, it has nothing to do with that. I just think your writing's gotten a lot tighter. <laughs> And so I said to her, um, hey, I just want to, like, so are you okay with, like, that little child abuse-y part? <laughs> and, and she goes, you're damn right. Your generation's afraid to throw a punch. Wow. Yeah. I never did it again. Okay. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Hi. It's amazing how much I don't know where that sound's coming from. I oh, know. hi. Hi. Um, Why did oh, you sit up all the way there? <laughs> well, I just want to say I love your, that, uh, it's on um, YouTube, The Parenthood and the Great Adventure. Oh, thanks. I love that. It's but, in, it's in, it's written down in Tell Me More. Oh, great. It's the only place you can see it written. So as a mom of teenage girls, I'm just curious how, what your recommendations are for, I know you, you look at parenting, you have a lot of humor with it, and um, it's, it's difficult. And so I want to know how you stay relevant in your girls' lives when they don't want to have anything to do with you, per se, and they are so much cooler than we are. And, you know, like, Here are some new words that just entered our household, like daily dialogue. How many seconds? That is Claire's answer when I say, give me a hug. Yeah. This kid used to be in my lap. She was in my lap for, like, Eight years. <laughs> and now, how many seconds? And then recently I was hugging her, and I was, she was really holding on, and I was like, yeah, like she's back. She loves me again. And then I realized that she had her phone behind my head. <laughs> so I'm not, like, killing it on the staying relevant. Um, I mean, I really, it, it, nothing could be harder for me than to pull back and like let them come to me. That's so hard for me. It's like uniquely hard, it feels like. It's just a totally um, opposite to the way that I work, to what my instincts are. And um, so that's what I'm trying to do. And it, it's horrible, I hate it. So I, you probably have a better answer than I do to that one. I try, but the one thing I will say is that one summer I was teaching at Yale to high school kids. And one of the high school kids was my friend from high school's daughter. And then I gave that girl a ride home. So we were on a ride for like four hours together. And her name was JoJo. And so I'm riding with JoJo, and we're having the best time. And I can tell, like, JoJo is grooving on what I'm saying. Like, she is listening. We are connecting. And JoJo is the same age as Georgia. So sometimes when I'm driving in a car with Georgia now, I think, don't act like her mother. Like, pretend it's JoJo. Like, how would you talk to her if she wasn't your child? Like, you wouldn't ask JoJo, like, how's your homework going? 
you know, or like um, have a lot of people drinking at school these days, you know, <laughs> you know or do you know anybody who started having sex? Um, so I literally try to pretend like it's not my kid and like how would I engage with Claire or Georgia if she were my friend's child? And like maybe that's gonna direct the conversation in a way that would make it more engaging for them. What would your mother say about that approach though? Oh, for God's sake, Kelly. What do you wanna be friends with them? You can have plenty of friends, they only have one mother. That's for my mom, right? You're clapping for my mom. Okay, we have one last question. Okay. Um, this isn't so much a question as a statement because my daughter is 22. They come back. Yeah. yeah. Can I say, I, I want to end by saying uh, something about Random House. So you don't know because you're on the outside. But like not all publishers are the same. Not all publishers think so hard about how to take care of readers and writers. And it is such a joy. I have not, I have not always been a Random House writer. But I am like Random House for life. Like I am going to tattoo that little house to my ankle because <laughs> these are really great, caring, smart people. And I just feel very lucky to be here. So thank you for coming. Thank you for asking me.